I told you guys right now we could be millionaires, all right? All we have to do is travel across the country. Can you guys get ready to go in a week? All right? Okay. That week is important, by the way. Back then, to get across country, this was our country. California wasn't even in part of America in 1848. It wasn't until the 1850s, 51, I believe, where we became the 31st union, state in the union, if you will. To get across country, we just read the New York article, New York Herald, we got gold, right? Right across the country, we can get there. It would take you six months to get there. You had two choices back then. One, get on a boat. Go all the way down the Atlantic, all the way around South America, up to California. The two best things that could happen to you on the boat is one, you survive. Two, you get seasick. All the other diseases were much, much worse. But in six months, we can get to California and mine some gold. That's 397 days later. We have the knowledge. It takes us six months to get there. The other option is we can go across the top of America and the Oregon Trail down into California. And as long as we can get past the bumpy wagon and the Indians shooting arrows at us, we were good. 397 days later. Which by you historically, is exactly 165 years ago from today. If we left a week from reading the article, 165 years ago today, we would now be in California trying to mine gold. I didn't count leap years, so for all you geeks out there, don't, don't test my mathematician skills. <laughs> that knowledge we had if we left on time would have been powerful. However, had we waited about six months, it would take us 35 days. And we would have got there about two weeks after the guys who left right away. Except we would have been fresher, stronger hands, stronger minds, more people, better mining. The biggest problem is, guys, it only took six days from the guys from Oregon to get down from Portland to Sacramento to take the gold from us anyway. Knowledge is power only when you can use it. I followed two very powerful speakers, two very big, powerful companies. If they didn't have the knowledge or the foresight of thinking 20 years ahead, neither one of these people would be here because they used the knowledge they had in the timely side they had it. This is today's gold rush. Happened about 15 years ago. Everybody today uses a URL. According to Cisco, 2017, Every piece of electronic plugged in or not plugged in in your household will have an IP address. I don't know why we need an IP address in the toaster, but they say we're going to have it. Google gives us all the data that we need to make smart business decisions. Anybody use Google Analytics? Right? What do you use it for? You use it to find out who's accessing your site, how can I have a better business? What am I doing online? Where the traffic is coming from? All the great stuff. They give you all these great nodes and information. The problem is, if you read it in the morning, it's old by the evening. We are a society of instant gratification. And Google kind of invented that society. Funny, Marissa Meyer, who as you guys know now is the CEO of Yahoo, she was the first, I think she was the eighth employee at Google, and she was the first marketing person. She did her first focus group. She put 15 people in a room or 16 people in a room, put them in front of a screen, and said, okay, tell me what you think. Nobody touched the computer. Now, if you remember back then, you had AOL. You put the DVD in, you heard, connected. You've got mail. No one moved because they were all waiting for the screen to load. Because all it said was Google and search. Nobody knew what to do. Now, they give you all that knowledge you have. However, Steve Jobs, God rest his soul, 2007 gave us the iPhone. You know what he did by giving us the iPhone? He made every human being on the planet 
a New Yorker. Everybody. Okay? It used to be, hey, Bernard, how you doing? Nice to meet you. How's your day going? Great. We're still on for seven. No problem. Now it's uh, 140 characters. I'll see you at seven. I'm outside. Uh, I might call you back. That's okay. That's acceptable language. And then all of a sudden, this bird flew in. Now this bird said, yes, you know what? I want to communicate with people that it's not okay to say, I'll see you at seven. And I got a lot more to say, but I still have 140 characters. What do I do? I can't send you the lifeinmobile.com URL. I'm here today at Stanford Innovation Center. Please read my article, watch the video, .com, because that URL is way too long. Then comes along this company called Bitly and Google. Anybody use Bitly? Shortens your URL. You know what the problem that Bitly really created? It gave you more data. Google tells you everything that's going on in the final destination. Bitly now tells you how that link's being accessed in Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Now we have more data, more things to analyze, more things to do. Knowledge is power, only as quick as you can use it. Go back to San Fran. What you didn't see in that one article about how it said it takes 35 days to go, while everybody else was rushing across the country, the shipping company, who could have gotten there in 35 days on their own, they didn't do that. They said, we're not going to mine gold because the guys from Oregon got there in six. But we'll build a way to take these crazy New Yorkers from New York Harbor to San Francisco and charge them an arm and a leg. And you know what? We can do so because 15% of them are going to die during the transportation. So we have no recourse. Now, the problem is I have all this data. Raise your hand if you're a geek. OK. I'm going to rephrase that to be more, more detailed, right? Because I'm going to want to be geek like some of you guys who raise your hand. Raise your hand if you're a programmer. OK. So out of about 65 people in the room, less than 1% are programmers. The rest of us are business people. Fair enough? That guy is screaming into his phone saying, hey, my Harvard MBA just told me all this great information. For you Yale folks, we know he's kind of fibbing about that Harvard stuff, right? Because really smart people drop out early. He's saying, I have all this information, I analyze all my reports from Google, from Bitly, from everybody, and I want to do this stuff, why can't we do this now? I don't understand. If we just get this done, we can make millions of dollars for our company. What's the problem? He's waiting on this guy <laughs> to program it. Imagine 65 people in this room, all smart people. We have a conversation, we know that if we can all get out this door in the next 55 seconds, right, we're all rich. Yet. 65 of us have to talk to four people who raise their hand to make this work. Knowledge is power. We have the knowledge. We can't use it. Why? There's a shortage of programmers in our country. There's a shortage of programmers in our world. Plus, quite frankly, I have a whole group of programmers that I work with right up the block. They don't like us very much. We come in with these crazy ideas, and we use words like just. All right? 2008, no lie, my key engineer at the time almost had a fist fight with the head of my sales team for a company we built called Mobile Real Estate. Literally, a fist fight in the office. I'd never seen anything like it in my entire career. They were fighting because of the word just. I don't understand. You did that before. It took you 15 minutes. Why can't you just do this in 15 minutes? It's just a color. Change blue to green. For you programmers in this room, you know how frustrating that is. So we banned the word just in our entire company. Okay, just and if are gone. Now, here's Bitly. It's a link that goes out to the internet. You click on that link, it gives data back to a machine. That machine prints out a report that you guys have to analyze. That is a lot of work to do, especially after you read that report. It's yesterday's news. I don't know about you guys, but I don't read yesterday's paper. I either get it in the morning or I get the next day. Yesterday's paper, I can't read the following day because it's old. Well, what if every URL on the internet was listening and waiting to be reactive? Listening and saying, okay, here, I'm getting all this information. I'm waiting to do something, like a heartbeat, okay? You wake up in the morning, your heart's beating. Your brain didn't tell it to do anything yet. You're still in bed. Your brain then tells it to take the legs, push it over, 
Actually, in my brain, it says hit the snooze button first, right? Then get out of bed, then do this. This link on top, this revolutionary link that we have now, which you can embed in your current links, is not only listening like every other link on the internet, it's ready to go to work. Anybody want someone to do some more work for them? Right? We all agree we can use a little bit more time in our day. So here it is, like a heartbeat, learning everything about your consumers. Let me tell you what it's learning. What kind of phone do you have? Is it your first time here? What's the weather around you? It's links actually finding out, are you happy or sad? How can a link find out if you're happy or sad? Because as we just heard, location is key. Weather is key to location. If you don't adjust for the weather, you don't adjust for the mood. No one's selling a product to a machine. We're all selling product to humans. That's what we forgot about technology. We're all communicating to humans. You guys have the money. I want the money. I have to communicate with you. Otherwise, I don't get the money. Simple concept, right? Yeah, we forgot that concept as the internet evolved. Now, here's the problem, right? I got this link. It's listening. It's got all the data. I want to react to it. Man, if I can only get a hold of my programmer right now who's working on 17 projects that I just gave him to get done by Monday. Man, we just ran out of Red Bull in the office. I don't know how this guy's going to stay up. If I only had an extra hour. The thing is, the business people run the analytics and the decisions. The programmers run the world. In April, we equal that playing field. I am the wannabe geek. My co-founder is the geek. I go into his office with all these crazy things that says, if we can just do this, right, we make it big. First he says, listen, we don't use just, and get the hell out of my office with the word if. But it's true. If the consumer to the left, if I start out with an article in the morning that I put out, and I want it to go to that, that page, however, if you've already read an article before of mine, I want you to like me on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter, like me on Facebook. Maybe that's important to my business. I'll give you a better live application that we're doing right now. If somebody reads an article that one of our clients posts on Facebook, if they read it while their store hours are open and they're located within a mile from the location and it's not raining outside, they're driving traffic to their store with a unique offer timed to get there within the next hour. That same link okay, says, if that's true, send them here. If you click on the article because you were working late at 9 o'clock, the store is closed, send them to my website. However, if you're located in New York, California, and Texas, send them to Amazon because for some reason I get more orders from those three states than my own website. All of this business rule decision that was made, all the programming that goes behind that is now done by the same person with their finger, by the way. This is a drag and drop. Right from your iPad, you'll be able to do it. With your finger, you make those same rules. You never speak to a programmer once those rules are set. Hey, programmers, they're happy. They have the best job security on the planet right now, guys. Let's not kid ourselves, okay? If you get mad at your programmer, go inside. When you guys leave here today, you get back to your office, hug your geek, okay? Because they don't need you guys. They have jobs waiting for them everywhere. So hug your geek. So now knowledge is power. But now, the 99% of the people in this room can use it. That is the revolution that life in mobile here in Stanford is creating. I get questioned all the time of why are we not in New York City? You're a mobile company being in New York City, I don't understand. You guys should move to San Francisco, I don't understand, right? We built our entire company here in the suburbs. We're new to Stanford. We just turned a year old here in Stanford. Right, we've had a mobile company since 2008 that today is the largest mobile company in the residential real estate space, operating independently on its own, okay, which we're very proud of. Life in Mobile, who moved to Stanford about a year ago from Westchester, another suburb. We are also self-funded and profitable today, primarily because of our innovation. And we're very proud of that side. This is the mantra of our company. 
my co-founder, John Pax, loves Leonardo da Vinci. Brilliant man. There's no, there's no disagreeing with that. Technology, though, as I said earlier, is not the key to innovation at all. For those of you who are familiar with the 80s and remember a movie called War Games with Matthew Borwick, right? You saw those big machines that were computers run by one person with one monitor. In the same generation, we had Steve Jobs come out with the personal computer. Little box, little machine in a box started talking, everybody was excited. Same technology. What was the difference between those two? The art, not the science. They made the board smaller, great. I got a big board here that can do this. I got a small board here that can do this. You want to operate that for me? No. Wait a minute, I got a big board here that can do this, and I got a computer here with a screen, a mouse, and all you got to do is press some keyboards that you're already used to. Do you want to operate that for me? Sure, I can do that. It's like a typewriter on steroids. Plus, I can get rid of the whiteout. No problem. I'm good. The art is what we focus on. The humanization is what we focus on. Technology is only how we get there, right? Knowledge is power, but it's only powerful when you have the ability to use it. And today, right, I'd be remiss, and I'd also get yelled at, and he probably wouldn't work any late hours next week for me, which is really important. Uh, if I didn't recognize, in the back left corner there, I have Mike Batiste. Right? Mike Batiste is the man behind what has funded our company, our agency business, so we haven't had to go to VCs to bring Stanford, or to bring the world coming out of Stanford, this revolutionary technology that doesn't exist anywhere else on the planet. We're not making URLs smarter. We're not better than Google. We're giving humans the ability to react to the data that the machine gives you. We're making everybody the smartest doctor, the smartest mechanic, or I would say the best mechanic, if you will putting the power back in the hands of the people who make the decisions to run the business so all of the families can continue to grow in that nature. And I'm extremely honored to be in front of you guys and follow my two colleagues here. So thank you very much for that, guys.